it's working though. Anyway, here we go. Okay, great. So um, just briefly, what is an integral bridge? Um, firstly, conventional bridges um, allow expansion and contraction and movement of the deck uh, with expansion joints and bearings. But uh, these elements in a bridge structure require maintenance, which is costly and time consuming. So road authorities are, are heading towards integral type structures where the deck is cast monolithic with substructure. Um, but obviously these structures are going to be more complex because they have to accommodate movement of the, of the, of the deck, um, which would push outwards as it heats up in summer, pull inwards in winter, and there's also shrinkage and et cetera that one would need to take into account. So there's complex soil structure interaction occurring here, and obviously it's, it's more challenging to design. And in South Africa, we traditionally have not built integral structures, but the South African National Roads Agency is, is definitely wanting to head towards more maintenance, structures with less maintenance. So with this in mind, um, we are interested in South Africa about the environmental factors um, on the behavior of, of longer integral bridges, taking our dry and um, hot climate into account. And we're also interested in this earth pressure response um, behind the abutments because um, it's well known that one could get ratcheting, which is an increase in earth pressure, uh, which occurs because of this movement of the abutment um, that takes place in integral structures. And the big question that designers are asking is how long can an integral bridge be? So that's something we'd like to sort of move towards helping designers make better decisions when it comes to that. So we've monitored a bridge pretty much in the middle of South Africa in a little town called Tromsberg. Um, it's about 600 kilometers south of where uh, I am in Pretoria uh, on the national route between Johannesburg and Cape Town. Um, and it's a dry area, um, sheep farming, you, if you can see that, uh, not many people, lots of sheep and lots of antils. So that's where the bridge is and that's what it looks like. It's 90 meters long, which is fairly long for an integral structure, um, 14 and a half meters wide. There's five spans, the maximum, the central spans are just under 21 meters and the height is about um, five meters. And um, we uh, basically decided at the beginning of the project that we were only going to be looking at a monitoring system to look at um, the response of the structure to environmental loading, so temperature change, et cetera. So that's uh, pretty much where we, um, how we decided on, on where to place our instrumentation and what type of instr instrumentation to use. We've used a lot of vibrating wire strain gauges, um, some normal rebar strain gauges, um, a lot of the misters in the structure, 41. We've also uh, installed two shape accelerates uh, in the abutments, both the north and south abutments, which is basically a string of tilt meters so that we can plot the relative movement of the abutment. We've also got tilt meters at the piers, um, earth pressure cells behind the abutments, um, temperature hu and humidity sensors in the fill, and then we've also got a lot of concrete reference samples so that we could look at shrinkage as well. I'm not going to be talking about that, but that's obviously something we need to look at. So in total, we've got uh, 550 channels and we're logging every 15 minutes. And uh, also, just on top of that, at the end of the project, together with Cambridge, we installed some FPG sensors. Um, so it's fairly well instrumented. And there's a long section of the structure showing um, where uh, the, the, the instrumentation is. So pretty much our, our strain gauges are at mid-span and supports. And then we've got, oh, sorry, wrong way. Um, then we've got um, over here um, our string of tilt meters that was installed right down to the bottom of the cent central pile, that shape accelerate. The earth, earth pressures behind that wall type abutment um, and uh, the tilt meters at every pier. So that just gives you an overview of, of where the instrumentation is. A few photos of installing the instrumentation. That's uh, the shape accelerate going into the sleeve that we cast into the pile and abutment. Um, that's our earth pressure cells uh, going in. Um, and you can see the selected fill behind the um, abutment. That's definitely something that needs more clarification, I think, is what, what to put behind these integral bridges so that you can reduce that ratcheting, that increase in earth pressure. 
Um, these are solar panels that have just been stolen. We have had to replace them. Um, that is powering the whole, the whole system, working well. It's in the north-south direction, so we put them on the east-west side of the bridge, and it's, it's worked really well. And that's our logging cabinets with multiplexes, loggers, batteries. The batteries are also stolen, but um, we've replaced them as well. Um, so we, we're back on track. Um, and we've had a few site visitors as well. You can see sheep farming country. So we had a farm that it's going, uh, the farm, we had to allow, the, the contractor had to allow the farmer to herd a sheep to and fro. So a few site visitors. So um, I'd just like to show uh, some of the data that we're collecting and just how we're using that to, to again, understand um, uh, environmental behavior of these um, integral bridges a little bit better. This is a typical cross-section um, showing the thermistors, those 41 thermistors I was talking about. So you can see we've got uh, um, sort of a good distribution of the thermistors so we can get a, a good idea of what the temperature in the deck looks like. And you can see the deck is basically two spine beams, those beams are a meter thick, and there's a top 250 millimeter thick um, flange that connects the two of them. And if we just have a look at typical temperatures that we're seeing, uh, it's a little bit dark, but the, the black line is basically the, the temperature in the center of the one meter thick beam, and the gray line is plotting the temperature in the center of the central flange there. And you can see there's quite a big difference between the temperature in the thin section versus the temperature in the, in the thick section. And definitely the flange gets up to 40 degrees, whereas the beam up to about 30 degrees. And then also the beam doesn't get as cold as, as the flange does. Um, how does that translate into movement? Well, um, Movement in a bridge structure um, comes from the effective bridge temperature, which is basically a weighted average bridge temperature. A lot of work done on this in the 70s. Emerson pioneered this. And if we calculate the weighted average using all the temperature data that we had there, you can see how the um, bridge definitely doesn't get as hot and as cold as we thought. The, the maximum effective um, bridge temperature from design, it should have been 45 and minus 3, but we're not getting uh, near those values. We're going up to about 35 degrees and, and to down to about 3 degrees. So that's the effect of bridge temperatures that we're seeing. But the big thing in integral bridges is obviously the change in effective bridge temperature. So we've looked at this in a bit of detail. Here I'm plotting the, the normal distribution of the daily change. Um, of the, the bridge temperature, that's the black plot there, and comparing this to if we just had the one meter thick section or if we just had a 250 millimeter thick section. And you can see for the, for the effective bridge temperature, uh, the daily range or the daily change in temperatures on average is about five degrees. You can go up to a maximum of 13 degrees. But if you have a look at what could happen in the flanges, this could change in temperature by about almost 13 degrees. So definitely showing that the thermal inertia of the deck is very important to consider when you're looking at uh, what the movement of the deck could be. If we now have a look at how this is causing the abutment to move, uh, just there's a cross-section uh, cross through the abutment, just plotting the relative positions of the shape accelerator um, tilt meters and our earth pressure cells. And I've, I've plotted the top of abutment movement relative to October 2016 because that's when most of the shrinkage had occurred. So I've taken out the shrinkage and we're just looking at thermal effects on on the abutment, and you can see this sine wave. Also, October is kind of spring for us. It's the opposite, obviously, of here. So then it moves outwards, positive uh, displacement is out into the full, and then in, in, the, in the winter months, which is July, it pulls inwards. Um, and this compared very well with um, the prediction that we got using our effective bridge temperatures, but specifically the effective beam temperature. So we looked at the beam separately and then the deck separately. And we think that it, it compares well with the, the beam temperatures because we saw cracking in the flanges. So the flanges don't seem to be contributing too much to um, the expansion and contraction of the deck. It seems to be uh, the, the thick beam sections, which are, are uncracked. 
Um, if we then look at how this is affecting the earth pressure behind the abutment, you again see the sine wave as in summer it pushes out into the deck and you get an increase in earth pressure and then in winter the, the, the entire abutment comes back and you get a, a significant decrease in the earth pressure. And we haven't seen ratcheting yet, but we expect in the next um, season to see it. So the literature seems to say sort of within five seasons, you so should start seeing this increase in earth pressure. So we're looking forward to, um, thanks, we're looking forward to seeing what's going to happen in, in January, December um, coming up. Um, we, we see definitely pressures well beyond active and up to soil at rest and over. We haven't seen passive pressures um, yet, um, and, but that's what some people say you could expect in an integral type structure over time. So that's our, our lateral earth pressures. If we just plot that with the, the previous um, uh, diagram, the, the, the movement of the deck, again, uh, relative to October 2016 when the shrinkage had been taken out, you can see, again, the earth pressure increasing as the positive movement, the abutment moves into the fill and decreasing significantly as the abutment uh, moves away from the fill. Um, and we've done the same plot looking at effective deck temperature, where um, you can see pressure cell 5 is the, the cell at the bottom, um, the earth, earth pressure cell at the bottom, so obviously going to have higher um, earth pressure, but as the effective deck temperature increases, so your um, <coughs> earth pressure increases, and as it decreases, so your, your earth pressure is going to decrease. So what we are definitely seeing is that um, effective deck temperature is something that's very important to consider. So then we said, well, let's have a, let's um, do some thermal modeling. Um, we looked at a range of um, a specific heat and conductivity values for t typical range for, for concrete. And we looked at a specific day that we've monitored. We've obviously got weather stations there as well. So we've got the solar radiation values and we've, we've modeled uh, how the change in um, effective temperature varies with depth of the deck. So you can see how that um, as the depth increases, so the daily change in effective temperature and therefore the seasonal change in effective temperature um, significantly decreases. And we've plotted our measured values um, which compare well with the values that we've modeled and we also checked um, some of Emerson's values as well. We then took this a bit further and said, well, let's look at typical deck cross-sections, um, though we've also looked at some extreme values, so we've looked at some very, very thin uh, deck cross-sections, 150 millimeters thick to two, two meters thick, and then kind of everything in between, voided decks, etc. And we've also got the same trend. Again, looking at that same day um, in summer, looking at what would be the change in effective temperature, and you can see uh, now we've plotted it against um, the cross-sectional area per unit width of deck, and you can definitely see how, if you can understand the thermal inertia of your deck, if you can increase that, um, you uh, would significantly reduce the, um, the movement of the structure due to thermal effects. And obviously there's also, I haven't talked about shrinkage here, but shrinkage is also going to be, be um, will be reduced as you increase this cross-sectional area per unit width of deck. So just in summary, um, I think we're seeing that uh, the change in effective bridge temperature is something that one needs to understand and um, consider when you're looking at movement in, a, in a, an integral bridge. We definitely saw that the, the top of the abutment compared very well with the, what we've measured in terms of the effective beam temperatures, and we saw um, significant um, seasonal variation in earth pressure. We're hoping to see what the ratcheting pressures are going to look like um, in the next, in the coming seasons. But definitely, the smaller the effective temperature change is, um, a smaller t effective temperature changes are observed with decks with a higher thermal inertia or a higher cross-sectional area per per um, per meter <coughs> width. Um, and just to acknowledge. Everyone that was the main contributors in this project. Um, uh, yeah. Any? That's it. Any questions?